Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Understanding Drupal. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Mauricio Dinarte. I am known as Dinarcon in Drupal.org, Twitter, and pretty much anywhere in the internet. I am from Nicaragua. Uh, it is 88 degrees there right now. <laughs> so if you ever want to escape the cold of the Midwest, that's a beautiful place to go. And it can get really hot. Like we have active volcanoes and you can either watch like an online experience or actually live it if you go to Nicaragua. I work with a company called Agari, uh, which is based in Boston, where we are actually distributed. Uh, I am from Nicaragua, but we have people in Europe and America as well. And I am really passionate about teaching. Uh, I've been doing this for a couple of years already, and in the future I'm going to start a project to teach in Drupal in different languages. So hopefully that will come out soon. Uh, and I will start with English, Spanish, and French. And I am already starting to learn German, so at some point, German as well. Uh, this is an outline of what we're going to cover today. We're going to start with the very basics, like no assumptions, not even Drupal specific stuff. And from there, we're going to you know, build concepts and understanding. So to start, uh, just like a very general thing, uh, the difference between a web page and a website. So usually those terms are used interchangeably, but they are a little bit different. So when you have a website, let's say, um, you know, Amazon.com, that have pages for individual products and offers and services and so on. So the website in general is Amazon.com, but then you have a specific pages for each of the products and each of the other things. So in this case, we have one web page uh, that has, uh, excuse me, one website that has six different web pages. And for example, in the article section of your company or organization, for example, uh, you can have one extra page for each individual article. So this is going uh, to be useful when we learn how to um, map the concepts that we might know already from using the web in general and how those things translate to Drupal. And when we, you know, look at a web page in, in particular, we have like a footer, header, sidebars, uh, logos, and so on, menus, navigation, and things like that. So my objective for the session is uh, for all of the elements that we see on a web page, uh, understand what Drupal <coughs> calls them, and understand how you can modify them if, if you need. So you know, before we start, why do why do we want to use Drupal anyways? So let's see some examples. Until a few months ago, the White House was uh, built on Drupal. And that was the case for several years. You know, they changed uh, to another project, but just the fact that it was running Drupal for several years is already like a, a proof that Drupal, you know, is secure at the very least. Uh, Weather.com is also built on Drupal, and this is actually like the biggest Drupal website. It serves over one billion visits per month, and this is not only through the website but also through web applications. Like if you have the app on your phone uh, and you know you want to know what is the weather like in Chicago right now, it will actually connect to, to a Drupal backend. The gram is, is also built on Drupal. And the interesting thing about this one is that the night of the event, the whole thing is like live stream. And you also have like backstage interviews, photos, uh, you know, written articles, audio, and all the multimedia around one single night with massive traffic from all over the world, Drupal can handle that easily. Uh, Web Economic Forum also, and not very evident, but at the top right, uh, we have a language switcher, so your Drupal site can be multilingual. And, you know, there are a lot of functionality of the box, but if you want to invent the pirate language, for example, you can do that. Uh, examiner.com, uh, this screenshot was supposed to show the responsive uh, capabilities of Drupal, but it's a screenshot, so it doesn't respond to anything. But in theory, uh, depending on the device that you're using, if it is a phone, a tablet, a desktop computer, or even a 4K monitor, the content of the website is going to adapt to you know use as much space as possible and use it uh, in a very optimal way. And Naranja Tradicional de Gandia. So this is a small business in Spain, I think in Barcelona, where 
they you know they have an online store powered by Drupal to sell, sell their products. Uh, they sell oranges, tangerines, sweets, honey, mermaid, and lemons. So yes, Drupal can power you know really high-profile websites, but it can also power your own small business or your own you know non-profit organization or your own project. Tesla Motors is also built on Drupal. Uh, we haven't made it to the cars yet, but rumors has it that you know we we just put a fat and heavy in space and some way Drupal was helping that to happen. And in general, these are some of the features like uh, just to recap: security, multilingual support, e-commerce integration, high traffic uh, you know management, responsiveness of the content, and multimedia handling. So hopefully uh, this will, you know, give you some clues why a lot of organizations are not Drupal, and in, partic in particular universities, I know that in the States at least, uh, they use heavily Drupal, and other countries like standardize on the Drupal platform for their government sites, for example, Australia and Germany, their government sites, most of them are built on top of Drupal. So a lot of use cases for the education and uh, government sec sectors. And well, maybe I persuade you to, to use Drupal, but what it, what it is? Depending on who you ask, Drupal is different things. Uh, I'm going to talk about three today, but the one that we're going to focus is this one. Drupal as a CMS. So as a CMS, that stands for Content Management System, it allows multiple people to participate in the creation of content. And on top of that, it allows you to create publication workflows. Let's imagine that we work for a newspaper. You know, we have the journalist who writes the article, but this needs to go through a review process because before it, get, it gets published on the website. So we can have, for example, one person, the journalist, writing the article, but it cannot make it public out of the box. Then we have the editor, which reviews and make modification. The editor is not able to create, but he or she is able to modify what someone else already wrote. But let's say that in this case, uh, we need one final check or approval from the department chief before things go live. So the editor will pass along the article to the next person, uh, the department chief. This person is not able to create or modify content only to check if everything is okay and if that is okay, if that is the case, make it public. So you can have very fine-grained controls over who can create, modify, or delete content, and even view it. Like you can define who has access to the content that is it is already available. You can also have content revisioning, and this is how Drupal uh, names the way to track changes on the on, on the content that you create. Let's say that you know uh, something wrong goes to the website, you know, some user either made a mistake or did it on purpose. Drupal will keep track of all the changes that you make to the website, like letter by letter, image by image, anything that you do, Drupal, uh, and this comes enable out of the box, it will keep track of those things. And it will tell you when the change was made, like date and time, and who did it. So, you know, if it was a mistake, you just like revert back to the previous version of the content, and that was it. If it was, you know, on purpose that something put something improper on the website, you can do the same. Like you can revert back to a previous revision, and then you can block the user so that the user does not have access to do more harm on the website. And you can have very, very granular access controls. Let's imagine that we have an e-commerce uh, website, and we want to show the content exactly the same to everyone. But we have some VIP customers. You know, they buy from us frequently. So uh, the the content is going to be the same except for the price. If it's just like a general customer, they see the regular price. But if the, if this is like a VIP customer, they is, they are going to see the price with a discount already applied. So the images, the SKU, the product description, like the product name, everything is going to be the same except for the price itself. So the, the possibilities of you know, um, managing access controls in Drupal are pretty, pretty flexible. Drupal is also a framework. Uh, 
and the one thing to remember here is that mm -hmm. if Drupal does not solve your need out of the box, you are free to extend it you know, through programming to do exactly what you need. So it's extensible by, by design. And probably one of the most important things to me, uh, Drupal is a community. So, you know, lots of people from all over the world participating in making Drupal better. It is, it has been around for more than 15 years. So it's, it's a solid product already. And just the fact that I came here from Nicaragua to present this session, you know, it's a, it's a testament that we are a worldwide community. And in the, in the Chicago area, I know that there are a lot of companies that work with Drupal. There are user groups that happens that like have meetings at least once a month. So if you really want to get into Drupal, I highly recommend that you get involved with the community. Sometimes, like when I started, uh, it took me about six months to learn what I'm going, what I'm going to teach you in an hour. So I remember going to my first meetup and yeah, I have been banging my head against this problem for days and I just asked someone else with the experience and in less than five minutes I had a solution. So try to get involved with the community. <laughs> so some basic concepts uh, and again like feel free to interrupt me anytime. If I am going too fast, just let me know. So uh, the first thing to know about Drupal is what we call core. So core is the minimum package that you need to uh, install in order to have a Drupal project. If you don't have core, it is something else. Drupal core comes with a lot of things. The two most important ones are modules and themes, and we're going to cover them in a moment. And it is core, the thing that serves as a framework. So if you want to extend Drupal to something else, Drupal core is going to provide you the tools and the mechanisms to achieve that. So we said that we have modules and themes with Drupal core. What is a module? A module is something responsible for adding functionality to, the, to your website. Let's say that you have a personal blog and that every time that you publish a new article, you want something to happen. That something might be sending a tweet automatically or posting to your Facebook wall automatically. Anything that has to do with functionality is provided by a module. On the other hand, we have themes. Themes control the appearance of your website like the layout, how it's going to behave in different devices, um, like the color scheme, the fonts to be used, all of those things are uh, controlled by, by, by themes. So there is mostly a very clear delineation of the responsibilities. Functionality, those are provided by modules. Uh, appearance, those are provided by themes. And remember this in the context of Drupal Core. Drupal Core chips with probably 50-ish modules, not all of those are enabled out of the box because you know Drupal is supposed to be generic and not all the website will need all the things that Drupal can do. So both modules and themes can be enabled or disabled on demand depending on your specific use cases. And this is uh, Drupal core out of the box. But you know, again, Drupal is meant to be extensible and we have something called the contrib repository. Contrib in this context stands for contribution, and this is code that people like you and me that participate in the community have made available for everyone to use. Let's say that you know Drupal Core, for example, doesn't have an integration with PayPal out of the box, but there is a lot of use cases where you want to integrate with PayPal. So there were a group of developers who you know dedicated some time to write that integration and created a module that will allow you to accept either payments or donations through PayPal, and it made them, uh, they made the module available in the country repository for everyone to use. The same applies for themes and something that is called distribution. So Drupal can be used for so many different use cases, and sometimes you just need like a, a, an extra layer of configuration bundled out of the box. So those are distribution. Distribution are a prepackaged version of Drupal with uh, modules uh, from the country repository and themes from the country repository that are already pre-configured. For example, we have one called Commerce Kickstart that if you want to start an e-commerce solution on Drupal, you know, you can go download Drupal core and some modules and some themes and do yourself the configuration 
or you just download the distribution and it comes like out of the box already configured to have a you know a card workflow discount shipping and so many other things another example of distributions uh, there is one called open church for churches uh, open open outreach for NGOs um, and there's also other distribution for public uh, for like newspapers or the government sector and so on so all the things that you try to get from Drupal for different reasons uh, do it from Drupal.org so contrary to other projects like WordPress where you know there is a big ecosystem of premium themes and you know just go to this website and download this and go to the other website download that in Drupal.org we try to centralize that and mostly for security reasons uh, there is a team of probably 45 or so people around the globe that they focus on keeping the code on Drupal.org secure there are some guidelines around that for but pretty much if if you have if you see a green shield for a for a Drupal or a module or a theme or a distribution, you know it is covered by the security team. And that's a recommendation. Anything that you download from for Drupal, Drupal.org. And the only time that you won't do that is that if when you go to Drupal.org, they point you to some other place to download something. In which case you need to you know do some check-ins, but that's the general recommendation. Um, so we're going to get started with you know the CMS, the content part of things. Any question? Okay. So I'm going to be making a stop after every section, and if you raise your hand, I understand that if there are questions. Otherwise, I will just continue. So content. Um, the Drupal has been around for a long time, and sometimes it uses some terminology that is not very uh, evident or self-explanatory. One of those is the word node. So what is a node? A node is a piece of information that can tell a story by itself. And the node serves like the, the basic uh, element that is going to be used to store information on Drupal. So let's say that we have this card. What can we tell about this card? It is a red card, it has two doors, uh, four wheels, and you know I can say the make, the model, the year, and uh, so many other properties. So the node is going to be this piece of things where I'm going uh, to store this information. It's going to be a container. Uh, this is an example of a node in Drupal, and there are some properties that are common to every node in, the, in, in a Drupal website. For example, every node has a title that's mandatory. Every node also has an author and a publication date, which includes like date and time. Every node has a, a URL, so you know it has to be uniquely identified in some way by the system, and that is called node ID or NID for you know, for short. That is a number, the node ID is a number that starts with one the first time that you create a node and it increments by one every time you create a new node. So one, two, three, and so on. But let's say that I wrote a very interesting article and I, I tell you, you know, go to my website, agaric.com slash node slash 1582. Like by the time that you get home, you might have already forgotten that. So in addition to having these node IDs to be able to uh, reach a node on the, on the page, we also have something that is called URL alias. So that's like a like more a human readable way to call to call a node. Like in this case, it is agarit.com uh, slash blogs slash altering views results. That may be easier to know if you understand like the context of what I'm talking about. Um, and there are many other properties like if a node is either published or not published, for example. Uh, but you know th this is kind of the baseline of of what a node a node is about. Okay, so with nodes, we are able to store information about cars. Again, like year, make, model, type of fuel, uh, number of doors, number of windows, and so on. We can use a node to describe a car fully. But in the in real life, different objects have different properties. For example, you know we have cars, but what other things have wheels? We can have motorcycles, 
bicycles, recycles, in addition to cars. And in real life, these things have you know, very different properties. For example, as far as I know, motorcycles cannot go in reverse. For a motorcycle, it doesn't make sense to say how many doors or how many windows they have. So when we have in real life uh, some concepts that are very different from one another, uh, yes, they are all going to be storing nodes, but we need a way to differentiate them. And the way to differentiate from, for example, a motorcycle and a car in Drupal, it's called content type. So this is like the second layer of abstraction. Uh, a content type is, uh, you know, this abstraction that will allow you to group nodes that share similar characteristics or describe the same idea. And by this, you know, this can be physical things like cars or motorcycles or, you know, if three cycles, monocycles, and things like that. But it can also uh, be non-tangible things like events. So this event had a date, had a registration price, it has a location for the event, and you know so many other properties. So you can use uh, a content type to describe an event, and then uh, you know we store that information in Drupal. You can also have, uh, for example, articles. The article is, can be also a content type where you have you know the title, a tagline, an image, and the content content itself, and you know many many examples and we're going to see others along the way uh, but other than you know making this grouping of nodes the way that content has worked they also allow uh, to ease the management of the of the information on the website let's say that I am an online dealer where I sell motorcycles and cars uh, I can have in my website a, a specific page that lists all the nodes in my website that are of, of the car content type. So by that, I already like sort out everything else like motorcycles. I can have another page where I only store information about motorcycles. So, you know, uh, show all the nodes in the website that are of this motorcycle content type. And at this point, it might be confusing. So you're talking about nodes and content types. What's the relationship between them? And this is very important to understand. So every node is on one specific content type. You cannot have one node that belongs to, for example, a car and a motorcycle. That's not possible. The other way around that is possible and actually expected. For example, you can have a car content type that you're going to use as a template to store information about different cars, like 10, 20, 50, 100, and so on. Uh, the same, you, you will have a, a content type article that will save as a template to store articles on the website and you will have many of those. So uh, one node belongs to one specific content type, one content type can have many nodes associated with them. And in this image, the numbers in the blue circles represent the node ID. And if you see throughout the, the image, those numbers are not repeated because node IDs are not cannot be repeated, they are unique. And in fact, if you delete one, for example, if I delete node number two, uh, that two won't be reused. Like it will always keep incrementing and things deleted won't be reused. So this is like really important to understand. Like these two concepts are like the basic for everything else. Any question? Okay. So great, uh, we, you know, we have this online dealer and we are now able to separate all the you know cars from all the motorcycles in this in this page I only want to show cars but most of the time when like someone is looking for a car or in general just searching for something they look for a specific attribute like in the case of a car I may want you know a Toyota Yaris 2010 red for example so I'm looking for specific things just having this, you know, long list of all the cars in my website is not enough. So I need to be able to do a specific search, uh, to search on, on a specific attributes. So the way that we accomplish this in Drupal is using fields. And fields are awesome. I used to have a very long, boring um, description uh, slide here, 
which I'm going to show later. But before showing that, I want to explain the awesomeness of fields. So, anyone here has ever used either Facebook or Twitter? Some people. So let's let's focus on Facebook for the moment. When you are going to write a fa Facebook uh, post, you are basically free to do pretty much whatever you want. You can write a poem. You can you know just go ranting about things. You can ping people. You can add images, videos. You can you know mistype anything like random words and numbers. Basically, you are free to do whatever you want. And with Tweets, it's about the same. You have a lot of freedom in, in the way that you enter the content. But this model doesn't work when you try to look for something, when you try to search for something. Let's imagine that you know this dealer business also has a Facebook page. And you know they are very successful. Every day a new car comes in and an old car goes out of the inventory. So you know People will enter, you know, this is the photo, this is a red Toyota Yaris 2010. But every day that's going to be, you know, going uh, more posts, more posts. And even though both Facebook and Twitter have search functionality, if you have ever used it in, for this use case, you will know that it gets really hard easily because of many reasons. One of these reasons is that free text is not easily searchable. So people can write whatever they want in whatever style and format they want, and that does not necessarily match the user uh, criteria. Like they might, you know, just think differently or not use abbreviations or things like that. So the free text is hard to search. Also, when you have free text and that freedom, you are also able to enter inconsistent data. Like, you know, when this event happened, it happened on November 19, 2017, or you use NOV with a dot as a, an abbreviation, or you, you use like l numbers instead of letters to describe a month, or for the year you put two digits instead of four, or you use a dash instead of a, excuse me, yeah, a dash instead of a slash for the separator. Or if you are like in Nicaragua, we put that day before the month. So each person entering the content might do it in a different way. And good luck trying to you know, use Facebook or Twitter to understand what you enter if the person who originally posted the, you know, the post or the tweet uh, used something else. So it's not very hard. It's not very easy, excuse me. Also, you can enter inconsistent data or invalid data, uh, data, and this is going to make Drupal cry. So how old are you? Minus 10 years old. That doesn't make any sense. When is your birthday? February 31st. That doesn't exist. What is the price? So I use the dollar sign, but the euro currency. Uh, what is your email? No, not a real email. You're missing an app sign. Uh, what is the phone? Hi, I'm beautiful. Happy face. That's not even a number. So again, because you are free to do whatever you want, you can do those things very easily and, you know, with consequences, I guess. So, all of these things are going to make Drupal cry. Free text, inconsistent data, and invalid data. So, how do we make Drupal happy? Because we want, you know, Drupal happy so people can find stuff for us. We do that using fields. So, fields are able to enforce validation criteria. And there are many different type of fields. We're going to cover some of them today. Uh, for example, on the right, we have a number field. So for a number field, let's say that this is the price of an event like this one, like a Drupal can. Uh, we can say that the event might be free, but I'm not paying someone to come to my event, at least not today. So the minimum value for the price field is going to be zero. From zero, I don't define a maximum because if someone is willing to pay a million dollars to come, I will greatly accept it. Uh, we are in the States right now, so there is no need to confuse people or to ask people about currencies. We use dollars all over the place, so I make it very clear and, and specific. Dollar sign, USD, uh, currency code, and anyone both entering the content and then consuming the content will understand that I am talking about dollars are not euros or Cordobas like in Nicaragua. So, um, and in this case, I can make this field required. So I cannot create an event without 
a specific uh, specifying a, a price. Uh, on the on the other picture, we have an image field. So for an image field, I have different criteria to validate. For example, uh, what are the allowed file extensions like PNG, JPG, uh, GIF, and so on. For example, if I don't want people uploading animated GIF of cats on my website, I just remove GIF from that list, and Drupal will validate that those things cannot be uploaded. I can also define like minimum or maximum resolutions. I can also define maximum in a file size and other things. Uh, one, one important for accessibility reasons uh, and a little bit for SEO as well is the alt attribute. So sometimes when an image uh, cannot be displayed for some reason, maybe it's not available anymore or there are a lot of images and they are not loading quickly. So there is something called alternative text that is going to be used uh, while the image is loading. And with, with a field, we can actually enforce that to be entered. And that is not only like enforced, it is supposed to be meaningful. Because for example, someone using a, 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 a speech reader on, on their browser, they won't be able to, to see that picture or understand the picture. But if you put some meaningful text, they will at least have a sense of what you're trying to convey with that image. So you can enforce all of these things with fields. And again, there are different type of fields and using them makes Drupal happy. Uh, so what is the recipe for happiness? You use one field for each piece of information <coughs> that you want to store. Let's go back to the example of cars. You are going to use one field for the year, one for the make, one for the model, one for the type of fuel, one for the type of, uh, for the number of windows, for the number of doors, and so on. Anything that you want to store, you're going to use a specific field. And after doing that, you need to also decide what type of field is the one that you want to use. Because as I mentioned before, each of them will provide you with different validation criteria. In Drupal, we have integer, decimal, images, phones, email, URLs, and all of these come with uh, out-of-the-box validation. So if you want to enter you know, an email that is missing an at sign, for example, Drupal will stop you right away. It won't allow you to save the node because you're missing something. And so this, with this, Drupal will love you. Now, fields are also, are also awesome in the way that you can ask for information and display the information after, afterwards. So let's think about you know, an event like this one, a Drupal camp. Um, it has a location. How many different ways exist to represent a location, you know, a point on Earth? At least four. So you can actually put like uh, the name, like Lincoln Student Center. You can also put like the latitude and longitude on the globe. You can display a map and ask the user to click on the map to identify the location. But also, like in the same way that we have PDF or Word documents, some uh, formats, uh, document formats, used specifically to store geographical information. One of those is called KML. So in theory, in uh, I could provide a field where they upload a file. Like instead of uploading an image, they upload a KML file that stores geographical information and then Drupal can read that information to, under to understand where this event is happening. So uh, one field can provide more than one way to collect the information. Uh, in practical terms, it doesn't exist in Drupal a field to, uh, to collect geographical information that allows for these four, but combining different contributed modules, you can accomplish this functionality if you want it. But the point to remember is that you have a field and the field exposes many ways to collect the information. And once the information is collected, it is stored in, the st in, in a standard way. So you can present it any way you want as well. So maybe uh, you ask for latitude and longitude when requesting, but when displaying to the user, you show a map with a, with a marker. So the way that the information comes in is not necessarily the same that it comes out. You can change that as the field allows you to do. Like each field will define how you can enter and how you can display information. But more importantly, you can aggregate the information. So maybe you have a lot of events. 
bless you. You have a lot of events, and you want to show a map of all the events happening at the same time. So uh, you can do this again with fields. And, and this is a real website called Drupical. So another you know test that Drupal is worldwide. These are events happening all over the place all the time. So uh, one thing interesting about this website is that it combines information from different fields to, to show the map. For example, there must be a, 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 a field that stores the location, which is where the pointer is going to be you know, uh, placed on. But you also see that it is color coded. So there is another field that defines what type of event this is. And we are combining those two things to show a marker that has a specific color on the map. And other things that can be done. Uh, fields can be shown or hidden individually. So you can have, for example, uh, uh, an, an event that has 10 different fields, but uh, you, you, weren't, you didn't notice it, but someone came a few minutes ago to count how many people attended this session. So this information is relevant for the camp organizers, but probably not relevant to us attendees. So you can have a field in the session uh, content type that say how many people attended, but that's going to be hidden for the general public and only the CAM organizers are going to be able to see it. So you can have, uh, you know, that content type in your template to collect information. You can have a lot of things, but you're not required to show all of them. Or you can decide uh, for these people, I show some elements. For this other group of people, I show different elements. So it is very flexible, and you're able to do this on a field-by-field -field basis. Uh, yeah, some general examples. Uh, Single-line text field, multi-line text field, those are different in Drupal. We also have numbers. So when it says it's established in 2006, that is actually a number field, because that is supposed to store a year, and year are only numbers, and not only numbers, only integers. You don't say in 2006.5. So, uh, but when we configured this field, in the configuration, we were able to define a prefix so that every time someone enters the content, oh, this is about when this organization was established. And when people see the content, oh, this is what, you know, when this organization was established. So it is very clear. And because it is a number field, you have all the validation that comes with it. We also have URLs, uh, taxonomies, numbers, dates, time, and so on. There are like literally like dozens of fields uh, available. A lot of them in core, and many more in the contributed space. So this is the slide. Uh, fields allow you to structure the information of your website. Uh, they save discrete pieces of information like the year, the make, the model, and so on. And once you have this information in fields, you can display them in different formats. You can filter what elements you want to show or not. You can sort that information in any way that you might want. You can say, for example, I want to show all the cars sorted by the, the year, like the newest come first, for example. So, so far we have only talked about the center, the middle part. Um, we have a node where this node is one specific content type, let's say an article. It has a title, a tagline, an image, and a description. But what about the rest? What about of all the squares around the, the, the middle of in this image? Everything else is a block. So what is a block in Drupal? A block is a container of extra information to display an, along the main content of the of the page. Uh, the you know the, the main page content is your node but everything around it, those are blocks. And a little bit of a segue before talk, talking more about blocks is that they are always placed in a theme region. So if you install Drupal out of the box, it comes with this blue appearance. And that is a, a core theme called Bartik. Bartik de defines many different regions. Uh, each of them is represented by a yellow box in, in, the, in the screenshot. So whatever you see a yellow box, that means you can place blocks in that place. Uh, you can place content there. Uh, 
Remember that the theme is the one responsible for controlling how the different layout is going to behave. So for example, uh, Bartik has a, a, a region called Feature Top that has a gray background. If we install Drupal out of the box, we never see that gray stripe. Why? Because out of the box, Drupal doesn't play, place any block in that region. So Bartik decides to collapse it. Collapsing a region means to hide it. So if there is no content there, we just hide it. And the same happens for the left and right sidebar. If there is no content in those regions, uh, Bartik is going to expand the, 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 the content region, which is the middle one, to use you know, all the space available. Uh, at the bottom, where we have the, the black uh, background, we see four uh, boxes, one next to each other. The, those are footer regions, and in this case, Bartik doesn't collapse them. So if you put a block in the third footer region, it will not expand automatically if the other ones are empty. So remember, uh, the way that the thing is going to behave, uh, or, or the site is going to behave in terms of layout, that is going to be determined by the theme. Now, let's talk more about blocks. Blocks can be either uh, static or dynamic. So, this refers to the content or the information that they are going to display. Let's say that you know we have a copyright 2018 uh, at the bottom of, of our web page. That is something that is going to change once a year. So, in, you know, in a general sense, there is a static content. So if something is going to be the same or almost the same all the time, then there is a static block. You can also have dynamic blocks. Uh, these are things that change regularly, like uh, the latest blog post. If you publish something every day, that's going to be changing every day. If you publish something every hour, that's going to be changing every hour. And a lot of these things can be automated so that you don't have to do anything manually other than creating the content. You create the content and automatically the blog gets updated with the latest information. Blogs can also enforce visibility rules. So you can say this blog only makes sense in the context of an article. For example, if you have more articles written by the same author, if you go see an event, it doesn't make sense to have more articles written by the same event. So you can define visibility of blogs based on content types. You can also do it based on language. Maybe this only makes sense in the Spanish version of the website. You can also do it by pages, like this only makes sense in the front page, in the contact page, in the marketing section of the website. You can define rules based on the, on the path or the section of the website that you are visiting. And you can also do it by roles, and we're going to cover roles uh, later. Blogs can also be aware of their environment. So let's say more articles written by the same author. When Drupal is going to display this blog, it's going to see, okay, I'm going to show this for Node 5. Node 5 was written by Mauricio. So let's look for more notes written by Mar Mauricio and show them in, in this blog. So this is also possible. And Similarly to content types, blocks can also have fields. And this is new in Drupal 8. In Drupal 7, you had to use a module called Bean, B-E-A-N, to have blocks with fields. In Drupal 8, this comes out of the box. And you know, one use case can be, you have this a special offer block that has four fields, a title, a description, an image, and an expiration date. And you know, blocks of this type are going to be shown on the sidebar always until the expiration date comes. So you can define some logic like that using blocks. And everything that I mentioned about fields before apply for blocks and apply for other <coughs> things as well. Another very important concept uh, for Drupal is views. So we can literally spend the whole time talking about views, but we don't have the time for that, so I'm going to show you two slides and try to explain views as much as I, as possible. So in Drupal, view is a way to list information. So Drupal is a listing of information of, on the website. That can be a list of notes, a list of users, comments, content types, and, and fields. Anytime that you want to make a list of something, chances are high that you might want to use a view for that. And what is the job of a view? 
Abuse is going to scan all the content of your website and you can use it to also to filter what things you want to show like I want to show all the cars uh, that are red that are Toyota that are Yaris you can use views to define this search criteria and once you find all the nodes that match your criteria you can define different ways to present the information so you can have an HTML table or you can create an RSS feed for that or you can download a PDF document with that listing or a CSV or Excel spreadsheet or you know as we saw before you can have interactive maps image slideshows and many other things so that is views views collects notes or other type of information on the website and display them in many different formats uh, we have an example here uh, in this case we have a, a view with four, four with five columns a couple of things to to note uh, i am showing field information here and for example the first column has the plate the year, the make, and the model. Remember the recommendation. Uh, you need to use one field for each of this stuff. But when, and that is the case, like under the hood, you have a content type with fields individually for each of those elements. But when you display the view, you can actually modify how it's going to be presented. And instead of each of those using one column, you just can put them together. I also have images. And one interesting thing about images is that Drupal has a mechanism to pre-process them automatically. Let's imagine that you know we are all work for this car dealer, and we take pictures with our phones. Each phone is different, you know, different resolution, uh, different quality, and many other properties. But when displaying on the website, we want to try to be as consistent as possible. So in Drupal, we can have a way to say, okay. No matter the size of the image, make it smaller. No matter the aspect ratio, make it four by three. Uh, you can also define like watermarks or gray scales or other image effects. So, you know, you just define, I want to apply these uh, effects to the image and Drupal will do it automatically. Another thing that is possible with views, you can define like a default way to present the information but you can also allow the user to modify uh, that criteria to their needs. So uh, above the table and below the, the text that says cars, we see some like uh, text boxes. Those are called views exposed filters and they allow you to, you know, the user to say, okay, I want all the cars 2010 only. So they select 2010 and the representation is going to be updated to respect that. I want to show only Toyotas, I want to show only Yaris, I want to show by year descending, for example, or ascending, like the newest first or the older first. So again, this is possible because we use fields. So fields are going to allow me to monitor, to, to expose certain search or, or filtering criteria or sorting criteria for the user to, you know, to, to try. On the top left, we also have uh, a, a small car only one and there is also a view in the you know just a moment ago I said that views are used to show listing of th something and when I think of the word list it is two or more elements but in this case I have a view of only one element and in some cases cases that makes sense uh, if, if you read the, the text it says random car so you can define a view that shows one car only, but randomly. Every time that you refresh the page, a new car will appear. Uh, another use case for this kind of a scenario, when you have a listing of only one element, you know, can be the most popular article, the most commented article, the most uh, visited page on the website. Every time that you have the most of something or the best or you know things like that, you can also have a view that shows that like the top rank and uh, just to clarify views can be used uh, to show like the main content of the website like the table but views can also be used to create blocks so in the on the top left that was a block created using a view now you might ask why so much theory i mean uh, 
I thought that Drupal was hard. You're not confusing me with all these concepts. It is really important to understand all of these pieces because Drupal loves nesting. So we love, uh, if you're a front-end developer and you want to print one line of text, you will have like 10 level of divs to accomplish that. If you are a developer, you will have really complex data structures that are like one instead of the other uh, to accomplish what you need. But what is relevant to us, Drupal nest concepts. So all the things that we have talked today, uh, nodes, content type, regions, uh, blogs, views, all of, the, all of them interact together to build a page. So let's imagine uh, we have this piece of information, more articles written by the same author. To create that, we are at least interacting with five different concepts. On the almost layer, we have the theme region. So this is going to determine where this information is going to be displayed. Let's say the theme region is the right sidebar. Because this is complementary so a content, like more articles written by the same person, this is a blog in itself. So I have the blog, more articles by the same person. Because this is a listing, the listing was, was created using a view. The view was configured to show articles. Those articles are of one specific content type, but under the hood, those are notes in the end. And let's say that I want to show like the title and the tagline and the date of when the article was published. Those are individual fields on the node. So for one small piece of information, I am already interacted with five different concepts. And each of those is going to behave in a different way, it's going to be configured in a different way. If you want to modify it, you have to go to different places. So it's very, very important. If you're going to remember one thing of the session, remember this image. Uh, when assembling a Drupal page, a lot of concepts are going to interact uh, uh, simultaneously. For example, I, I might want to show uh, you know, all the users of my website I can replace the blue box uh, from Node and say, show a list of users, for example. Or I want to show a, a static blog. I will only have a theme region and a blog, and I don't have all the other inner layers. The point being that for everything that you show on a Drupal page, there will be many things interacting at the same time. And with this, now we have seen like the main, that the middle can be either a Node or it can be a view, and all the things around, those are blocks that are built in different ways. There are many ways to build blocks. So again, this is very important. Any question with that? Okay. So as I said before, for each of those things, you will have different uh, uh, section of the website of the Drupal administration uh, interface where you're going to modify how they behave. So it is super important to understand what they are, to know what they are. So users, let's talk about users. A user is a visitor to my website. Anyone that goes to my website is a user for Drupal. Again, Drupal can handle multiple users as I said before. So an example. All the users have a username, have an email, they optionally can have an image, and you can attach fields to users. Like again, the same concept that I described uh, about fields for content types, for blogs, users can also have fields. So in this case, I, I have uh, a bio field. Similarly to nodes, users ha also have a, a, a unique numeric identifier, which is called user ID or UID for short, and you know domain slash user slash one. Again, that's kind of hard to remember numbers, so you can define path aliases for users as well. So in this case, com slash people slash Mauricio Dinart. Users can also have uh, language settings, so if they speak more than one language and you're website is available in more than one language, they can decide in which language to use. And if the language that they choose is not available, uh, you can define like a fallback language, like English, for example. Uh, users can also define time zones. And this is like even in the States, like, you know, you have at least four time zones in the continental, you know, 
part of the United States. Uh, this event, let's assume we were live streaming it. Uh, it was supposed to start 11 a.m. you know Central Time, but it is noon Eastern Time. It is nine uh, Pacific Time, I guess it's called. So when when you have users, they can define their time zone, and if you have events. Drupal will do automatic time zone conversion to adapt to each specific user, for example. And let's let's assume that I want to give uh, you know Mauricio the permission to add content to my website. How do I do that? How do I manage permissions? Uh, so it's a combination of two words: roles and permissions. A role is a collection of permissions, and we're going to see what permissions are in a moment. But roles are, are used to assign privilege to a group of users. They can map you know, your, your hierarchy in your organization. Uh, out of the box, Drupal comes with three uh, roles. One is the anonymous user, like if we go to you know, New York Times to, co to read the content only, that's like an anonymous user. We don't have an account like in Facebook or Twitter. We just go to consume. Uh, if you have an account like username and password, you become an authenticated user. So with that, you can do things like posting comments, for example. But then we also have the administrators who are able, who are able to like do pretty much anything they want on the website. Uh, but it is really hard for a website to you know be it all or nothing. You also have like middle level permissions. So you can create your own permissions like editor. So the editor can modify but not create or the department chief, you know, what I described before. You can have, or in addition to what Drupal provides out of the box, you can have more roles with a specific set of permissions. And what is a permission, by the way? A good question. Now, can you get granular as far as, you know, having like an end user and be able to control what content they see based on roles and permissions? Yeah, so the the question is if how, how granular you can get, and for example, if you have a, Anonymous user, you can determine how much content they, they can see. Well, they, once they log in, they can they, you know they have to log in. They, they log in. I mean, they're they're not they're they are uh, you know coming to the website, a consumer of the website. But I just want to control exactly what content they see based on their login. Yes. So the the way they control content once a user has logged in yeah. is actually through roles. So you create a role, and you know, as I said before, the role is a, a collection of permissions. So for that role, you know, role A, you define the things that they can do, like post images, post comments, and things like that. And a permission is actually very simple. It's like a yes or no question. A permission is this user, based on their roles, is able to perform a specific action on the website. And there are literally like dozens if not hundreds of permissions in Drupal. It's really granular. So you can say, you can create content of that article, you can revert revisions, you can post comments, you can use the site-wide contact form, you can view the price field with, with a discount in the event content type and things like that. You can get like really, really granular and it's a combination of both roles and permissions. And just to tie things together, this is how the Drupal permission system works. If you want to assign Mauricio uh, the possibility to see the discounted price for an event, how do you do it? You don't assign permissions directly to users. You do it through roles. Remember that a roles is a collection of users uh, of permissions, and then for that user, you can assign one or more roles. And the user is going to be able to do the sum of all the roles that they have assigned. A user can have two, three roles assigned, and they were going to be able to do, you know, the sum of all of those things. And that's in general how 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 it works. Does, does that answer the question? Yeah, actually. And like the other way is, is is true as well. Like if you want to deny access to something, you simply remove the permission of of the role, and then the user won't have access to that. Okay, another thing are menus, and menus, very simple concept again, they are a collection of links used to navigate the website. Uh, menus can be hierarchical, so 
we have two examples here. At the top is like a one level menu. It's only like five links, and that's a menu in Drupal. But you can have hierarchies like sub menus and so on. And with modules, you can get really crazy. And I don't recommend it to be honest, but just to see the possibilities. Down below, we're using a module called TV Mega Menu. And with that, you can embed YouTube videos and other information along your menu. So if you need to do it for some reason, there are possibilities to do it. Uh, and the last concept that we're going to cover today are taxonomies. And to be honest, this word scared me when I first heard it, but it's super simple. Taxonomy is just used to classify the content of your website. And by classification, it's like also doing the connection between them. And you only need to understand two things, vocabularies and terms. So a vocabulary is just a name that serves as a container. So I have the vocal vocabulary called fruits, and it's going to be a container for terms. In this case, I have a term for apple, strawberry, orange, and grapes. So the vocabulary is the name container, and the terms are the individual elements inside that vocabulary. And as many other things, taxonomy terms can also have fields. So in this case, I associated an image field so that in addition to displaying the, you know, the fruit name, I also show an image of the fruit itself. Um, vocabularies can also be hierarchical. So, you know, living, living organism categorization, we have kingdom, phylum, class, you know, humans are, are supposed to be animals in the cordata phylum, in the mammalia class, and way like 17 level deeps, we are almost up in sapiens or something like that. So you can have hierarchical structures for taxonomies as well. Some real life example, pet categorization, you know, you have all the, all the nesting that you need. And other not so useful real life examples, you can have, uh, when you, for example, we display an article, you can have other articles um, tagged with one specific term and use that as like related content, for example. And there are also modules that extend this taxonomy system so you can show, uh, for example, access controls based on taxonomy. So there is a module called Workspace Access that ties that permission system with a taxonomy system if, if you need it. Uh, in Drupal 7, there was a module called Location Taxonomize that for a specific term, you were able to associate geographical information. So for example, if you tag something like Chicago, Milwaukee, Boston, and so on, then just by tagging that, you can use geographical information to display pointers on a map. Uh, the module is no longer needed in Drupal 8 because in Drupal 8, taxonomy can have fields out of the box. It wasn't the case in Drupal 7, but you can accomplish similar functionality. And again, super important to understand the concepts because you will interact with all of them when building a page. And in fact, like, for one page, you can interact with 200 of all of these things at the same time. An FAQ that, to be honest, no one asked. I invented myself. Uh, and it is like, there is a saying in Drupal that every time that you have core, God kills a kitten, please think of the kitten. And the word hack, in this case, again, it is overloaded. It is not what we hear in the news, like some hacker came to my website and you know asked me for a ransom. In Drupal, when we say hack, we mean modifying the code that we get from Drupal.org. If you change one line, one semicolon, anything that you change, that is considered hacking in Drupal. And that's bad because you, know, you can modify how the system works in very weird ways. Most importantly, you can modify, for example, how the access control system works, and you can be granting access to people that shouldn't have it. So please do not modify or have core at all, <laughs> unless you know what you're doing, because there are some valid cases for that, but in general, don't do it. So if you're not supposed to modify core, but you have a specific need, what are you supposed to do? Uh, you use the API. Remember that Drupal is a framework, you use the API, and to learn more about that, you can check out this session. Um, slides are available. If you want to learn more about theming and how the Drupal you know, presentation layer works, you can see that session that I also presented. 
And I highly, highly recommend you to get involved with the community because you will get your question answered like way, way faster. Thank you very much. I would really like to, you know, to have your feedback. Thanks. So I know that we're over time already, so if there are no questions, otherwise I will be around through the whole campus.